Hey, everybody, it's John from The Hustle Daily Show. Before we get into the news today, did you know that HubSpot launched an AI chatbot that helps you build awesome campaigns at scale with just a few prompts? It's called Campaign Assistant, and it's a totally free to use AI tool that will transform the way that you build marketing campaigns at scale. And the best part, it works seamlessly with all of HubSpot's marketing and sales tools to scale your output across email, social, and more. So AI your way into the most effective campaigns yet at HubSpot.com slash campaign dash assistant. All right, it is Thursday, October 6th. I am Rob Litters here with Juliet Bennett-Ryla, and you are listening to The Hustle Daily Show. Today, we're talking through two stories. Tupperware has long been known for selling directly to consumers through its Tupperware parties, and also for the fact that its lids are absolutely impossible to find no matter what. But the company's branching out. It wants to reach a new generation of consumers and recently struck a deal with Target. Juliet is gonna help unpack that. Then we're gonna talk about remote work. Before we get into it, let's take a quick look at what else is going on in the world of business and tech. Meta updated Facebook's newsfeed, allowing users to choose what types of posts they want to see more or less of. New York Yankees slugger Aaron Judge broke the American League record for home runs in a single season. Some people consider it the real home run record um, because it's the most home runs anybody's hit who has not been accused of using steroids. The ball caught by a fan could be worth up to $2 million, and the fan has said that he does not know what he's going to do with it yet. Wow. West Elm's new Roblox world offers players mini games and over 150 furniture, and home decor options for their virtual homes. Next, we have a lawsuit. There are three consumer groups suing the U.S. Treasury Department that want alcohol to come with nutritional labels like food does. I feel like that bodes pretty poorly for alcohol because I doubt there's too much nutrition going on in um, most of what we're drinking. (laughs) Lastly, Peacock grew to 15 million subscribers in Q3, up from 13 million in Q2, making steady progress. All right, Juliet, let's talk about Tupperware. This is an iconic American brand. It's been around forever and they are switching up how they're going to market and and how they're selling to consumers. Tell me a little bit more about this and and what do you see in here? So Tupperware is going to be available at Target, both online and in stores. And this is a, a pretty big difference for the company because typically, yes, they sell direct to consumers via Tupperware parties. Um, This is the decision from Miguel Fernandez. He's the new CEO for about two years, uh, so relatively new to the company. And he was writing about it in a LinkedIn post saying that they're trying to reinvent themselves for a new generation of consumers unfamiliar with direct sales. I just found this whole thing really interesting because I have never been to a Tupperware party, but I'm pretty sure my mom went to a Tupperware party. Oh, same here. Like, I'm pretty sure everyone's mom did. A hundred percent. And yeah, so Tupperware parties were a big deal, like back in the day. How did they come to be? Like, how does a company decide that they're going to market their product that way? Because it's pretty unconventional, at least for today's marketing choices. Yeah. So this is actually really fascinating to me. There is an article in Smithsonian Magazine that is all about this woman named Brownie Wise. And she did not invent Tupperware. That was a guy named Earl Tupper. He was a plastics inventor. And basically he made that double seal lid, which is why, you know, Tupperware is so good because gotcha. it keeps food fresh, it seals, it's airtight, it's watertight. But when he was trying to sell his products, they were not selling because at that time, people did not have plastic containers and they just didn't get them. And it was like today you're like, I know how to unseal and seal a plastic right. container. Like everybody knows how to do that. But it kind of had this um, the seal you had to press down on the seal and then like burp the air out, like lift it up and let the air out, I guess. And they call they called it burping. Right. And people were like, I don't know what this is. So <laughs> that's amazing. Brownie Wise was this woman. She was like an advice columnist and a secretary. And she had this idea, basically inspired by other direct sales companies, where she just recruited people to host Tupperware parties where they would have their friends and family over and show them how to use the product. And it just totally took off. And it was so successful that by 1951, Tupper had hired her as the vice president of marketing, which at that time was like an unheard of position for a woman to have. They were just going, they were selling like hotcakes, like every, like Tupperware parties, as far as I can tell at that time, 
were actually kind of fun. Like it was friends getting together. They like played games where they would like put grape juice in the bowl and then throw it around to show how, how safe it was and it wouldn't like. That's amazing. Yeah, it just seemed like, oh, and that was like a, a great way for people to get together at a time when women were mostly, I don't know, going to church functions and, and very little else. And people could make money off of it. Not a lot, but it was like a, a good side hustle if you were like your neighborhood Tupperware lady. Right. Unfortunately, uh, Wise and Tupper did not really get along. And by 1958, he had ousted her from the company. Then he sold it for $16 million. And then he kind of just went off. Like he ended up moving to Costa Rica and just like <laughs> doing his own thing. But Wise's parties lived on. Like Tupperware kept doing that for years. Um, and in 2019, they had over 3 million people who were still selling Tupperware. That is crazy. And pretty genius. More brands should do this. Stuff. Yeah, well, I think that's I think that's where the problem is and why maybe they're moving into Target partnerships because so they had tried to do Target before in like the early 2000s. The CEO at the time were going so had been with the company forever. He'd been there like 30 years. He was like, "Oh, this was a disaster. There are sellers stopped selling because there's no point and then it resulted in a decline in sales and it was just he, he eventually said like it's going to take us 2 years to recover from this. We're never going to do anything like this again." Then he retires, new guy comes in 2 years later, they're doing it again. And <laughs> the thing that I think is interesting here though is when I am reading about these Tupperware parties that people used to have, I'm like, "Oh, these actually seem fun. Like if my friend really wanted me to come to a Tupperware party, maybe I would go to a Tupperware party." But Right. Inherently, I like cringe at the idea because I have grown up with I, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which was an Amway is headquartered. Oh, yeah. And I remember like going to so many job interviews or being invited to stuff and then you'd get there and it'd be like, surprise, it's Amway. I'm trying to get you to sell Amway. Oh, my God. Or like you get people who message you on Facebook after like 10 years and they're like, hey, hon, uh, I have a small business. It's my, you know. Right. There's a mid-level marketing scheminess to to this, right? Like, yeah, it's just, it's gotten so cringy where it's like, it's not your friend inviting you to a fun party with games and no pressure. If you want to buy something, go ahead. Now it's like, I'm trying to recruit you to sell for me. And then you're going to make a bunch of money, but you're not really. And you also have to spend all this money up front. And you know, the other, the thing with Tupperware too, is like their products last forever. I was reading a thread of people who were like debating whether Tupperware was like a scam or not. And a lot of people were saying, <laughs> no, it's definitely not a scam. Like, I don't really want to go to a Tupperware party because I don't like direct sales, but I still have Tupperware from the 1970s. So they didn't prepare, <laughs> like they made a product that lasts for decades. So there's not as much of a need to keep buying more and more products, though they did experience a big boom amid the pandemic because people who got really into home cooking all of a sudden were actually going to virtual Tupperware parties because they were like, oh, I need Tupperware because I'm making a casserole every week. And what am I going to put it in? Yeah. So that premise in theory makes a lot of sense. You shouldn't need to buy any more, but you inevitably have to because the lids literally disappear. I have no idea <laughs> how it happens, but I literally have a cupboard full of Tupperware right now without a single matching lid. Yeah, I, I think that's unfortunate because like it, it sounds like at one point this was like a really fun side hustle for people and the parties were fun and they totally seemed really charming. And I was also reading, you might think it was just like upper class suburban white women who were doing this, but the same Smithsonian said it, it actually was all, all sorts of people who were doing this. But nice. now I just have such like a eh feeling when I think about going to any sort of party where I'm expected to buy something that like, yes, I just want to go to Target. <laughs> totally. All right. So, Rob, your story today is about how working from home has been a game changer for people with disabilities. A hundred percent. So it's crazy. I feel like every day I see new articles when we're doing news sweeps about working from home and remote work mm -hmm. and whether or not companies are enforcing people coming back to the office or letting people work remotely or letting them work in a hybrid environment, whatever you want to call it. So it really seems to be this debate that's like continued to rage on. But one implication of working from home that I think is just objectively positive is it's made it much easier for many people with disabilities to join the workforce. And this was something that just like wasn't even on my radar. And it's had this massive impact. I mean, I think one thing that's crazy is the disabled community in America includes 42 and a half million people. So this isn't mm -hmm. just like some very small niche group. It's, I think, about 14 or 15 percent of the American population. And this group reached a 37.6% labor force participation rate in August, which is getting really close to the all-time record from 2008. And when you look at the actual 
workers that are working, they actually did surpass the total number of workers in June, which is just crazy. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I don't think anyone would look at me and and say like, oh, you have a disability. But before I got eye surgery, I was a negative 13. Wow. Which is very, very not good at seeing. Yeah. And I have actually, I still have like no night vision. So about seven years ago, I quit driving. And so for me, commuting is such, it was such a huge deal. There were jobs that I applied for and then I realized it would have taken me two and a half hours to get to by bus. And I just like, that's just too much of my day. And remote work, not having to commute is like, it's a game changer for me, for sure. Is that is that something you're seeing as well in these reports? Oh, 100%. And I think like you bring up like a really great point because I think when most people think about disabilities, their brain immediately goes to a wheelchair. And the truth of the matter is there are, there are a million different types of disabilities. Right. And a lot of these people are probably highly qualified. Right. But they just have this this barrier that's been in front of them for so long. That's really unfair. And I think if this can remove that barrier, then it's absolutely a game changer. And it's it's honestly something we should have been doing a long time ago. Totally. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you all for tuning into the Hustle Daily Show. Our editor today is Ezra Trupiano and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email and have a great day. We will see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you listen to the Hustle Daily Show on Google Podcasts, we want to let you know that the option will no longer be available pretty soon. Google is sunsetting its podcast app sometime in early 2024 in favor of YouTube Music, and we want to give you a heads up before it's too late since that time's almost here. The Hustle Daily Show is available everywhere and anywhere that you listen to podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you're using YouTube Music, we are there as well. If you're an Android fan, there are plenty of apps like Overcast, Pocket Casts, Player FM, and more. So just search for us wherever you decide to listen to your favorite podcasts.